Oh, of stuff. I know. <laughs> the House Committee on Families, Children, and Seniors will now come to order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Cherry Young. Present. Representatives Papia. Present. Glanville. Present. Arbet. Present. Edward. Present. McDonald. Present. Wozniak. Here. Fox. Johnson. Here. Thompson. Present. Madam Clerk, you have a quorum. Excellent. I need a motion to approve the minutes of our June 6th meeting of Representative Edwards. First one I saw. All right, so today's a good day. Uh, following up on testimony we had on last week, today we'll be voting out House Bills 4676, 4677, and House Bill 4678. Now there is a substitute for House Bill 4676 uh, that ensures foster care youth are provided with enrollment in school within five school days. Um, so that replaces the word that said immediate. That's something we worked out with the department. Uh, so now I need a motion to adopt uh, H1, House uh, Substitute H1. So moved by, do you all have it? Okay, Representative Kofia. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? On the motion to adopt, Cherry on. Yes. <laughs> Representatives Kofia? Yes. Glanville? Yes. Arvid? Yes. Edward? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Wozniak? Yes. You say pass. Yes. Fox? Johnson? Pass. Thompson? Pass. Madam Clerk, we have six yay, no nay, three pass. Substitute H1 for House Bill 4676 is adopted. Okay. Uh, and now we need a motion to report House Bill 4676 with recommendation as an H1 substitute. So, oh, did I already do that? Okay, so moved. Madam Clerk, we call the roll. <laughs> call for the vote. Oh, wait a minute. Who did the motion the last time? Okay, I need a motion to report House Bill 4676 with recommendation as an H1 substitute. So moved by, this is a different, no, she did the last one, but you can do this one too. Representative Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On the oh. motion to report um, the H1 substitute for 4676, <clears throat> Chair Young? Yes. Representative Kofia? Yes. Glanville? Yes. Arvid? Yes. Edward? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Wozniak? Yes. Fox? Johnson? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Madam Clerk, you have six yay, no nay, three pass. HB 4676 is reported with recommendation as substitute H1. Okay. Next, there will be a substitute for House Bill 4677 to require DHHS to provide the report to the legislature annually, something that we talked about. A question was asked about that. Now I need a motion to adopt the sub. So moved by uh, Representative McDonald. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. On the motion to adopt the H1, Chair Young? Yes. Representative Tapia? Yes. Glanville? Yes. Arbet? Yes. Edward? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Wozniak? Pass. Fox? Pass. Johnson? Pass. Thompson? Pass. Madam Chair, you have six yay, no nay, four pass. Substitute H1 for House Bill 4677 is adopted. All right. Now, I need a motion to report House Bill uh, 46 with recommendation as an H1 substitute. So moved by Representative Glanville. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. On the motion to report HB 4677 with an H1, uh, Chair Young? Yes. Representative Coffia? Yes. Glanville? Yes. Arbit? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Wozniak? Yes. Fox? Pass. Johnson? Pass. Thompson? Pass. Madam Chair, you have six yay, zero nay, four pass. HB 4677 is reported with recommendation to substitute H1. All right. Now I need a motion to report House Bill 4678 with recommendation. So moved by Representative Arbit. Please call for the roll. On the motion to report, Chair Young? Yes. Representative Escoffia? Yes. Glanville? Yes. Arbit? Yes. Edward? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Wozniak? Yes. Fox? 
Yes. Johnson? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Madam kind of Clerk, you have six yay, no nay, four pass. HB 4678 is reported with recommendation. All right. Thank you. Got that out of order. Thank you for your support, members. Uh, next, we will have a presentation by the Area Agencies on Aging. First up will be David La Lumia. <laughs> right? There you go, Executive Director, Area Agencies on Aging Association of Michigan. Thank you so much for being here with us on today. Excited to hear what you have to say about your organization. Well, thank you, Representative Young and members of the committee. It's a, a great uh, honor and pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about the Area Agencies on Aging Association and, of course, our uh, 16 members. And um, now we're going to see if I can operate the uh, slide. There we go. Uh, there are 16 uh, Area Agencies on Aging that represent uh, and cover all 83 counties in Michigan. I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with some of the things that AAAs do uh, in your uh, communities. The mission of the AAA network is to create comprehensive and coordinated local systems of care to allow older adults and people with disabilities to live independently for as long as possible. And you may have heard reference to uh, the aging network and um, that sometimes means different things to to different people but the triple A's are certainly a part of the aging network but they're not the only part and the aging network as we think about it comprises uh, agencies and individuals at both the are at the federal state and local levels and the Administration for Community Living, which is part of the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services, um, administers the Older Americans Act, and the Older Americans Act dictates a lot of uh, how AAAs operate and some of the, uh, the things that, um, that they must do to remain in compliance with the Older Americans Act. Uh, one of the things that it requires is that, there's that each state designate a state unit on aging, and in Michigan, the state unit on aging is housed within the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the Older Americans Act requires uh, the governor to appoint a commission on services to the aging. And the commission is uh, very active here in, in Michigan. They have a planning function. They approve uh, an, a three-year uh, plan on services to the aging. And, and in fact, the commission meeting on Friday is going to review and um, potentially approve the, uh, the uh, state plan on aging for the next three years. The commission also approves the formula, the, it's called the interstate funding formula, which is used to distribute federal funds across the, the AAA network. Uh, they approve uh, allocations of Older Americans Act funding to AAAs, and they require uh, in addition to their own three-year planning process, they require annual implementation plans of each of the, of the AAAs, and they review and um, approve those. So the 16 area agencies on aging, of course, are a part of the aging network, as are uh, more than 1,500 provider organizations around the state that uh, deliver services directly uh, to older adults and people with disabilities. And that network uh, employs more than 10,000 uh, direct care uh, workers around the state. And um, one of the issues facing the aging uh, network right now is the uh, dealing with the shortage of direct care um, workers that the aging network experiences uh, just as, um, uh, as uh, hospitals, health care, behavioral health, and other health and human services um, organizations. Uh, the Older Americans Act was amended in uh, 1973 to create um, AAAs and to give states the, the opportunity to designate AAAs in their, um, in their states. Uh, the, the Older Americans Act talks a lot about coordinating services and supports for adults 60 and over and people with disabilities. Um, it requires state level plan and local planning. 
It uh, finances uh, home and community-based services, and there are a number of different, um, I call them titles, to the Older Americans Act. One of the titles is home and community-based services. Another title is uh, caregiver services, and um, that's a relatively new title. But in Michigan, we have um, over 1.7 million of our citizens that are considered uh, family and informal caregivers and who are uh, providing care and supporting family members, spouses, uh, neighbors, friends, and um, the uh, issue of supporting caregivers is, uh, is something that the appropriations committees are, um, are dealing with uh, right now to, to um, authorize uh, caregiver resource centers that would be created at the local uh, AAA l um, level. So, the Older Americans Act also finances uh, nutrition programs, and you're familiar with uh, with home delivered meals. And there's also a congregate uh, a congregate meal program. But in 2020, in Michigan, 9.6 million uh, home delivered meals were um, were financed by the Older Americans Act and um, and delivered by the the AAA network. The uh, OAA. Uh, recognizes option counts, options counseling and, um, and advocacy as core functions of area agencies on aging. And as a result of that mandate, AAAs have become a, a trusted source of local um, information and assistance across the state. Uh, AAA services are they're funded from a number of different sources. Uh, the Older Americans Act is an important funding source. There's also a state act, the Older Michiganians Act, that provides uh, direction to the AAA network and provides a significant appropriation. Um, the Medicaid program is um, uh, a very significant one, and the My Choice uh, program um, is a statewide program that, um, that provides Medicaid services to help people stay in their own homes, and I'm going to say a little bit about that um, in, in a minute. Uh, also, uh, right now, most counties in Michigan have a uh, local senior millage, and senior millages have become an important uh, part of the way that, uh, that aging network services are funded. And, and not all of the um, millage funding uh, goes, flows through the area agencies on aging, but in many cases, the um, AAAs are involved in, um, in that. Yes. I've been forgetting to push the button. Thank you. Funding of there we go. That's what we're on, and now we're on my choice. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me say just a, a quick word about the My Choice program. Again, this is a Medicaid program. Uh, for someone to be eligible for My Choice, they have to um, require a nursing facility level of care. And the program provides in-home services and supports to, to help people live independently and remain in their own home uh, as long as they can. The My Choice program is administered by 20 uh, waiver agents and 14 of those are um, area agencies on aging and then there, there are six waiver agents who are not part of the uh, the AAA network. Um, this, is a, this is a very valuable uh, program. It's something that's very popular in the communities and in addition to allowing people to continue to live where they where they want to be in their own homes, it is an efficient use of um, Medicaid funding and uh, and, and state funding as it's uh, significantly less expensive to serve someone in the My Choice program than it would be to send uh, an individual to a nursing home. Finally, I would like to conclude by saying a word about what the AAA network likes to call the Michigan model. And uh, I've been with the uh, association now going on four years, and one of the things that I've come to understand and appreciate about the, the AAA network is their ability to um, blend funding and as we sometimes refer to it, braid funding in order to create um, a program that meets an individual's, um, an individual's needs. So uh, we can, uh, the Aging Network can provide uh, home and community-based services for an individual uh, financed by the Older Americans Act, by the Older Michiganians Act, by 
or by the Medicaid My Choice program. So we can serve an individual whether they're Medicaid eligible or not by this blending or braiding of uh, funding. And the program then is able to, um, it doesn't have to stop serving an individual if they uh, lose their Medicaid eligibility or they, it's determined that they're not eligible in the first place. And this is going to be very important as we uh, wind down the public health emergency, as Medicaid um, redeterminations uh, begin once again, and we're certainly going to find uh, some individuals that have been enrolled in the, uh, in the My Choice program who are not now eligible, but depending on their need, they will be able to continue to be served through uh, the Older Michiganians Act or the Older Americans Act funding. So um, this is a seamless uh, home and community-based uh, uh, services approach, and I think it's really in health and human services, as I've observed, it's, a, it's quite a unique, um, seamless, integrated uh, system of, of care that will continue to provide essential services, uh, you know, irrespective of uh, somebody's Medicaid eligibility. So it's been a, it's been a great um, opportunity to, today, and uh, Madam Chairperson, I'd like to thank you and to uh, thank the members of the committee for your attention this morning. And um, uh, I'm very anxious to hear the, um, the comments from two of our uh, AAA directors who are here to talk about local services uh, and programs. And, and with that, um, Madam Chairperson, I would yield and thank the committee very much. Thank you so much for your presentation on today. Do we have questions? Can wait until oh, I want to wait. Oh. <laughs> to the bottom. However, <laughs> okay, all right. You say, oh, I see a bunch. I don't know. Okay, yeah. So I just like it when it's fresh. Well, I appreciate you. You know, he's he's the senior member here, so you know we're 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 learning. Yeah, I'm an older uh, American. <laughs> Me too. And that too. And they're they're pretty bossy folks, I'll tell you that. You know, yeah. um, I did see Rep. Glanville, and then we'll go over to the side. So, Representative Glanville. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I've had the great pleasure of working um, fairly closely with my uh, Region 8 area agency on aging. Um, and so I'm excited about to, to hear what some of the other regions are doing as well. Um, and I just wanted to circle back to what you talked about with the caregiver resources um, and just lift that up for he, us here in the committee. I think um, you know many of us who are caregivers do not recognize that we are caregivers because that's just, it's my mom and dad, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, as we're coming into this, I, I, I really want to just, like I said, kind of flag that for the committee and for you as well, I think, of lifting this role up um, and how so many of us are affected by the services of the area agencies on aging and the importance of the role that you play in the community, not just for our older Americans, but for that next generation as well. Um, so thank you for that um, and look forward again to hearing about um, some of our other regions and how we might yes. be able to support your work. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Wozniak, Vice Chair. Right Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. I, I've, um, being an elder law attorney, I've really appreciated the services. I'm in 1B, and uh, they've always been great for all people that I've referred them to. Um, so are you still dependent on volunteers for delivering the meals altogether, or, or you, you have, did you experience any shortage during the you know the COVID experience. Yeah, there's been a shortage of volunteers, and it's it's made uh, home delivered meals more uh, more challenging. Uh, but I think that um, that Heidi and Ron will be um, able to talk a little bit I figured, um, yeah. better about the the situation with respect to volunteers and and the home delivered meals program. And how, approximately, would you have any estimate as to how many? family caregivers they are there are in your system or the coordinate with your system yes um, right now um, the the older americans act and it's title 3e of the older americans act that specifically aims funding at caregivers um, that really has been the that program has been more symbolic than actual uh, actually uh, moving the needle on supporting caregivers uh, those we, we are serving about 5,000 caregivers right now through those older Americans Act funds and we know from research uh, that's been done that there are 1.7 million 
um, individuals that would identify as, uh, as caregivers right now. So we're not even beginning to scratch the, the surface of what needs to be done with that population. And many caregivers um, uh, may not require assistance, but some do. And the, con the condition of people that they're caring for change and become more complex and, uh, and additional responsibilities are added. So, uh, you know, our proposal is to, is to create these caregiver resource centers at the local level, which would provide uh, information, um, but would go beyond information, would provide if someone needs it, counseling, e even to crisis intervention, respite care, things like that, to uh, make sure we can support our caregivers that are performing such an incredible um, service uh, to, the, to the older adult population. Yeah, I've always felt your organizations are undervalued and they are really of tremendous value to our state. Your program and the PACE program combined, I think, take uh, good care of our elder people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Fox. Thank you, madam. Chair. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> good to see you. I know we've spent many times uh, together on Zoom, so and uh, also other meetings, but. I have one big picture question and then one more more local question. Um, I know we worked a lot on communication between 4A, MISH, and AAA, and then with the locals. How how do you see that? How do you see that that has progressed? You know, over the last couple of years, the communication and working together of the various levels. Yeah, I think communication is an important issue in the aging. Uh, the aging network is um, is broad and encompasses uh, you know everything from direct care workers to uh, service provider agencies to triple A's and onto our you know colleagues at the state and federal levels. So um, there's uh, there certainly is communication between local triple A's and their provider networks. And I know you've had some direct experience uh, with that, and um, sometimes. Um, you know, you can always improve on communication, I guess uh, I would say, but it's uh, certainly an emphasis point uh, for us, and we understand the need for good communication. And the, the same is true f for communication between the AAAs and, you know, and then the State Unit on Aging and the, um, and the MDHHS uh, staff. Uh, things happen fast. Uh, sometimes they're difficult and complex, and... Um, we, we really need to focus on uh, great communication at all levels. And, and my more local question is I've got, uh, in one of my counties, I'll, I won't get into the specifics, but uh, the Council on Aging um, has just kind of been shut down by the county government. And I'm wondering, is there anywhere in the network somebody that can give some uh, some advice in relation to uh, county governments and uh, you know local COAs, Council on Aging's Commission on Aging's working together. Um, it's it's you know I I'm trying to keep myself out of the middle of it very honestly, um, but uh, you know is there within the network somebody that could that uh, either the county government or the council could go to for uh, some help and advice in this picture. It's, and it's all over finances, as you might guess. I, I would just, I would say that um, the first stop should be the AAA. And, and I'm sure there's been some communication between the, the program I advise that, yeah. and, the, <laughs> and the AAA. But beyond that, um, the staff at the uh, Bureau of, of, um, of Community Living and Supports that Scott Wamsley heads up over at MDHHS. They are, they're a trusted source of uh, advice about situations like that. And, and I would, um, you know, I, I would recommend that uh, the, the organization try Scott Wamsley and the ACLS okay. Bureau. Okay. Thank you. Representative Kofia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Um, nice to see you, and thank you for your testimony. So I just had a follow-up. Uh, you mentioned that in our appropriations budget discussions right now that there is a proposal, uh, an allocation for caregiver resource centers. 
I'm, I'm trying to continue to wrap my head around what that will look like for the caregivers coming to that center. Is it sort of meant to be a clearinghouse so that they can map out and get referrals, for example, if they need a s specific set of supports that they may not know about because they're just starting to care for their parents or whomever? It, does it include referrals and kind of a, a sort of a wraparound concept, if that makes sense? Or yes. what to what extent, what supports are available through the resource centers? If you could go into a little more detail about yep, that. Yep, it would be a combination of both virtual um, information type assistance and through the um, statewide website, there would be referral, there would be a geo routing referral capacity so that an individual um, could become familiar with and aware of what's happening at their local level and be referred to their uh, local AAA uh, caregiver resource center. So it's a it would be a combination of virtual and uh, and in in person hands on. Services. Okay, so it's not just a website that they would go to that would have information they could follow up, but actually they would be interacting with yes. humans it, and directly and getting that kind of direct support. It would be a website, but far beyond a website as well. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take one last question, then I have a couple comments. Uh, Representative Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a couple short questions. When it comes to long-term care ombudsmans, number one, how many do we have in the state of Michigan and who do they report directly to? And then the second one is, would you be able to answer questions about the Medicaid waiver program? Or, should, or do we have someone else that is going to be speaking on that? I'll take a I'll take a, a try at the waiver programs and uh, question. Um, so, uh, with the aside from the ombudsman question, with the the waiver program, if they qualify to, if they're qualifying for admission into a nursing home and they choose to stay in their home, are they? eligible to keep their home then because if they were to go into a nursing home they may have to sell their home to cover the cost so this allows them to keep the real estate in their name as long as they qualify yes yeah one of statement? the requirements of medicaid eligibility is that the um the value of your home is uh, not considered when an individual's uh, assets are um, viewed to and as Mr. Attorney, if that's uh, <laughs> correct me if that's not, not the, the case, but um, yeah, a person's home is not considered uh, an asset for determination of Medicaid eligibility. Uh, I'm excited to, to hear that we offer that. Um, I know my, that's one reason why we didn't put my grandfather in a facility because he would have had to have sold his home to pay for it. Um, so I, yeah, looking into that a little bit more. And then how many ombudsmen do we have in Michigan for long-term care and who do they report to? Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact number of um, of ombudsmen uh, that we currently have, but uh, the ombud there are different ombudsmen's. There's a there's a nursing home ombudsman. There's an uh, ombudsman for the dual eligible program, which is called My Health Link, and uh, the ombudsmen uh, report to their to an organization which is which is funded. Um, from state and federal funds to um, operate that program. And it's the uh, Michigan Elder Justice Initiative um, program where most of the ombudsmen um, are housed. But the ombudsmen's, ombudsmen uh, work very closely with the, with the AAAs. And one of our appropriation um, issues this year was the um, shortage of long-term care ombudsmen and our uh, our ask was for a $3 million appropriation, uh, which would finance 33 additional um, ombudsman staff uh, around, the, around the state. And we're still working on that one, but I believe that the department agrees uh, with us that there is a shortage and that uh, hopefully we can find a way of addressing that thank not you. too far down the thank road. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony. One thing I wanted to ask is um, I used to work for a Detroit Area Agency on Aging, so I'm glad they're here to be with us today. Um, but in your overview of your services, and I know we focused on services for uh, older citizens, but do you all still offer services for 18-year-olds and older with disabilities? Yes. 
because yes, that's a part of what you do that most people don't think of just by nature of the name of your organization. And so perhaps when we hear from the others, we can get some additional details on that. I just want to be certain nothing yep. changed no. over the past 10 years. I'm working. You are correct. <laughs> thank you so much, Director, for your testimony and for your uh, spending some time with us on today. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, next up, we will hear from my good friend. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We will hear from Representative Kofi's good friend. <laughs> Look at that. We will hear from the Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Michigan Executive Director Heidi Gustine. Is that correct? Director of Community and Business Advancement, uh, Katie Lane. Candy. Candy. Candy Lennon, come on down, ladies. You are next up. Thank you so much for joining us on today. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson, and thank you for having us, representatives. Are you ready? All right. We would like to talk with you this morning, uh, this afternoon, excuse me, um, about Northwest Michigan, about the Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Michigan, but also the, the challenges of serving a rural geography, and then get into some parting thoughts. So little picture of, oh, could we go back just a quick second? Little picture of Sleeping Bear Dunes to bring you into Northwest Michigan and ground us there. So thinking about the population changes of Northwest Michigan, it's no secret it's been in the governor's headlines about the population crisis that we are facing as a state. But Northwest Michigan in particular, and, and really south or north of US 10, is aging faster than the rest of the state. When we think about the population demographics as a whole, one in four individuals in the state of Michigan are over the age of 60. And we think about 60 from a policy perspective because that's where the Older, the Older Americans Act comes into play and uh, county senior millages come into play. Um, Northwest Michigan is aging at a rate of almost one in three older adults. And so when we look at this chart, you can see the trend from the census of 2010 all the way through to 2021. Northwest Michigan is at 31% of um, older adults in, in our population. Next slide, please. But more specifically, we have counties topping out, Leelanau County in particular, at 41% of our population is 60 years or older. So when we think about infrastructure, we, we are seeing the need for fewer schools and more thinking about community development for older adults and what that means for our, for our systems and our services. When we think about older adults, looking at the national poll for healthy aging in 2022 and 2023 by the University of Michigan, 88% of older adults want to age in their homes. So we know this, and we want to look at programs and services that allow them to do this. 48% of those living at home don't have anyone that can help them if they need help um, when it comes to personal care. So those very intimate um, services of bathing and toileting and dressing and as we, we start to need that help and that care. When we think about paying for it, only 19% of those living alone are sure that they have the resources to have someone come in and help them provide those services. And then when we think about social, social isolation, particularly coming out of the pandemic, one in three older adults have no contact with someone outside of their house in, the, in a given week. So those are pretty startling statistics about social isolation. Next slide, please. Um, Dave talked about braided funding, and in Northwest Michigan, we're very blessed to have 10 counties with county millages to provide base level of in-home services. Uh, in, including that in-home care as well as home delivered meals. And then we have the Older Americans Act and state fundings that provides care management for frail older adults in home services and meal, home delivered meals. And then we also have Medicaid funding that we're able to braid with, so nursing home placement as well as alternative to nursing home placement. We've already talked about the My Choice Waiver Program as, as a program that does this, and we'll talk a little bit more about this further in the presentation. So about the Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Michigan. We're a private 501c3 nonprofit organization. So if you've seen one Area Agency on Aging, you've seen one because we all strive to meet the local needs of our constituencies and our geographies. We're approximately 45 employees. Most of ours are social workers and nurses that are case managers, really wrapping around those older adults as well as adults with disabilities, old 18 years and older. Um, we serve 10 counties in Northwest Michigan. We're lovingly referred to as Region 10. We're serving a, pop, or a square mileage of square, 
square rule miles of 4,722 square miles. And then we've got that population of about 96,000 seniors. So our mission is to serve and advocate for older persons, adults with disabilities, and caregivers by supporting their independence, dignity, and quality of life. We have some core services that we provide, and these are largely mandated out of the Older Americans Act. So when people come to us, they're often in crisis, and we're looking for unbiased support and services. And so we're, we provide information and referral and options counseling, and this is prescribed out of the Older Americans Act. So anyone, whether they are an older adult, a family member, a caregiver, can come and ask us questions about aging needs, about the long-term care continuum, and we'll provide unbiased options, whether it's to our agency, to PACE, or to any other organization that provides service. Um, in that we provide caregiver support. So we're wrapping around that caregiver to say, hey, what's going on with you? How can we support you? How can we talk, to, listen to you and talk you through your situation? And then we also have our Medicare Medicaid assistance program, which helps in individuals navigate through the many options that they have in, for Medicare, as well as Medicaid subsidies to help pay for premiums. We also provide programming as alternatives to nursing home supports to help individuals live at home, and that's the My Choice Waiver program. So in that, we are putting nursing home level care in the home, so that personal care, we're coordinating the care with our nurses and social workers, and then creating a plan of care and contracting with our network of, of, of um, agencies to go in and provide that care. Next slide, please. Dave talked about home delivered meals and congregate meals. So the funding passes through the federal and state government to our agency, and we contract that out uh, to various councils and commissions on aging to provide home delivered meals. And we assess to make sure that the appropriate food and um, food administration guidelines are being met, uh, making sure that seniors are the meal sites are operating according to standards, and that we have a registered dietitian on staff ensuring that those programs are met. And then we also have advocacy as part of our mission. So we're advocating on behalf of individuals for systems change and as well as for funding needs. Every three years, we're required to do a needs assessment. And coming out of the pandemic, we particularly saw an uptick in needs. So people don't know where to turn to by the time they are in crisis or, or where to access services. We're seeing that caregiver burnout really uptick. They kept people at home during the pandemic trying to care for, themse care for their loved ones and they just burned themselves out. Um, there's a more of a need for in-home services that we're seeing, com compounded by a shortage of workers. Um, the social isolation factor, behavioral health needs have really escalated increasing elder abuse, including financial exploitation. And then we pay for a view of the Bay in our region. So there's increasing demand on housing and transportation and food insecurity that we've seen. Challenges of living in rural North, Northern Michigan. So we're really, uh, we're spread out geographically and this gets compounded. So we have people living in low density areas that makes getting to and from um, transportation highly reliant on cars rather than public transit. In many of our counties, we do not have public transportation. So there's greater distances to travel to get care, and this means that many times people are going without or they're going with limited care. The separation of, of households from convenient access to services also is really compounding that social isolation factor. Next slide, please. So this plays out in many different types of scenarios. One is access to care. So when we think about medical care, even though we're home to Munson Healthcare, which is a regional tertiary center, many people live greater than 60 to 90 miles from care. Um, and even though we're growing more and more dependent on telehealth, we have large swaths of ge geography that don't have access to broadband and cell phone coverage. And then there's the, act, the, there's the trouble of affording it when we do have it. When we think about geography, for Manistee County is an example, we deliver 1,500 meals in a week, but it takes 2,479 miles driven to deliver those meals. And that's an example of one county to meet the needs of Meals on Wheels. And yes, we do have a volunteer shortage um, that was exasperated by the pandemic. And then there's just inflation. So the, co the costs of housing going up, the cost of transportation, the cost of food, we're seeing more and more seniors on the risk of homelessness, um, greater food insecurity, that lack of social support. We're seeing more choosing between food and medicine and just the, the compounding um, inflation ramifications. 
The direct care workforce shortage is escalated in Northwest Michigan because it takes, there's fewer warm bodies up there um, because it's an older population to fill these positions. And then the transportation challenge is it takes longer to get to a home and it's increasingly more expensive to provide that care for that direct care worker. There's also fewer vendors providing transportation for senior needs because it's just becoming too expensive with the, the shortage of workers as well as the rising cost of transportation. So with parting thoughts, I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I'd like you to thank you for everything that you're doing. I know that there's a series of bills that have gone through to support housing, whether it is the, the low-income housing or the missing middle housing. Anything you can do is a, a tremendous effort and we, is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Chairman Young, for your work with the Food Coalition um, to address food insecurity. Thank you for your work uh, in appropriations for the direct care worker wages. Um, we're greatly appreciative. And with that, um, I will yield. I was waiting on something to end on a really high note, like, and this is really great, but we've got to deal with reality. And so there are so many challenges. So we, we're grateful that you were here to share those challenges because that's what helps us as lawmakers figure out exactly how we continue to support. Um, Representative Kofia, Dusty, raise your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much. It's great to see folks from Northern Michigan come down and talk about our aging population. And Madam Chair, I did ask um, the folks to specifically speak to not only the services, but the challenges to, because rural Michigan, you know, there are a set of challenges around senior populations. And you all have heard me uh, talk a lot about housing, right? And, um, and a lot of those pieces, they really do tie directly into how best we're going to be able to support our most vulnerable. I did have a follow-up question though, Madam Chair, if I may. Um, so you spoke about the population in Michigan, one of your first slides. Um, Heidi was about uh, seeing population uh, changes and increase in seniors. Now, our region, Grand Traverse and Leland in particular, we are seeing a population increase, yes? In Grand Traverse County, yes, Leland yes. is neg negligible. And with the population increase in Grand Traverse, which is of the region for folks who don't know, um, many of the surrounding counties to Grand Traverse are in the 17 to 25,000 population, but Grand Traverse is 94,000. Uh, the, the population increase we're seeing is seniors, yes? More older uh, Michiganders and folks growing, um, coming from out of state to retire there. So I just think it underlines the need for supporting senior services in, in the region. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, do you know how many clients you currently have out of the 96,000 seniors in your area? We support about 200, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 individuals through the MAP program. Um, information and assistance, we help about 1,000 people per year, 1,000 to 2,000. And then in terms of case management, we're doing about 800 per year. Okay. And obviously, uh, with the uh, lack of internet and broadband and, and the advance of telehealth, you still have a void there, right? We do. Yeah. Yes, we're doing a lot of things telephonically or in, in homes. Yeah, we'll see what we can do on that. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, too, so much for joining us and for your presentation on today. Okay, next, as we switch out technology, next we'll hear from, hear from uh, Ronald Taylor. President and CEO of Detroit Area Agency on Aging. Thank you all. And joining him today is Ms. Deanna Solomon. Uh, she wears so many different hats. Uh, what's your title today, ma'am? <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank you so much for joining us on today. Feel free to start when you're ready. And thank you so much, Madam Chair. And also just uh, thank you to the members of the um, uh, uh, Family, Children, and Seniors Committee for inviting us and for having us today. Um, we are, as uh, Madam Chair alluded to or stated, that we are from the Detroit Area Agency on Aging. And the Detroit Area Agency on Aging is an organization that has been around um, in the metro Detroit area for 42 years, since 1980. And we serve the communities as kind of unique in regards to um, the communities or how Wayne County is split out. 
Um, our agency actually serves nine communities within the metro Detroit area. And those communities are Detroit, Highland Park, Hamtramck, Harper Woods, along with the five gross points. And our sister agency known as the Senior Alliance, they serve the remaining portion of Wayne County um, so that we can deliver services and reach our constituents where they're at. Um, and it is our mission and what we try to do and what we try to live by is that we're really trying to create a community that cares for the vulnerable and, and we can advocate for the well-being of all, especially uh, advocate for the well-being of our constituents. And um, so we've, we've been doing that and we try to operate from a perspective of what we call from a management and also an organizational perspective of being servant leaders in regards to what can we really do to enhance and to improve the lives of our constituents and everybody in which we interact with. Slide. So as related to some uh, um, demographic facts and, and Heidi alluded to it and it's been a conversation that's been going on for quite a while. The need and the importance of AAAs and I would say other community-based organizations is as critical today as it's ever been. And the reason in which I say that is because as a nation and also as a state, we are in the midst of what we would say is a historical demographic shift in regards to our population. And what we're really, do, what we're really seeing and what is really occurring is that we are witnessing the grain of America. Um, and not only are we witnessing the grain of America, but we're witnessing the grain of Michigan. And, we, and the reason which I can say that from a, from a, what I'll say is a global perspective, is that the World Health Organization has alluded to the fact that uh, within this world, um, older adults will outnumber children by the year 2050. Um, within the state of, or within this country, the U.S. Census has indicated that older adults will outnumber children by the year 2034. In southeastern Michigan, this phenomenon is occurring at, even, at an even more accelerated pace, where older adults will outnumber children by the year 2026. Uh, so within the next three years, there will be more older adults in our community than there will be children. And within our service area, we have approximately, I would say, 153,000 individuals that are over the age of 60. Um, 48,000 of those individuals are disabled. Um, one in three of those individuals live alone. And the fact about it is that one in three, and, and Heidi spoke about the social isolation, that those individuals that are living alone, generally they're spending more than or what, we, what we've calculated as far as 12 of their waking hours by themselves. So that social isolation is very key, it's very real, and it's, and it's something that we're really trying to see how we can address through uh, technology and other means. And another fact is that more than one in five of our older adults actually live in poverty, which is double the state rate. Um, and through our services, we have been able to touch uh, one third of our population, uh, one third of our constituents. So uh, the Detroit Area HCO Nation has been able to reach 51,000 individuals and related to our services and programs. Of this number, 19,000 have participated in our caregiving and education support and training services. Approximately 10,000 individuals have received meals from our organization. Over 3,500 individuals have received long-term care through our clinical services and over uh, 1,400 individuals have participated in our health and wellness programs. And um, if we go to the next slide. Um, this next slide, it, I just kind of don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think it's critical that we speak about this issue and this study that we've, what we have. And the reason I say that is that Maya Angelou once stated that in order to understand where you're going, you must understand from whence you come. And the Dime Before Their Time report, which we have, um, which has been around since the year 2000 and has been subsequently updated every 10 years with the most recent edition being um, updated and commissioned in 2020. The Dime, Before Their, the Dime Before Their Time report essentially reflects four areas or it takes a look at four areas. It takes a look at hospital utilization. It takes a look at morbidity. It takes a look at morality, I mean mortality, and also in regards to access to care. And this report um, 
based upon its genesis, has served as our North Star in the Detroit area, in our, in our community, because of the findings um, which it has revealed. And the um, Diamond Before Their Time report essentially, if we can go to the next slide, Dan, the Diamond Before Their Time report, I won't go through each and every uh, bullet or anything of that nature, but the report re essentially reflects that in our service area, older adults die at twice the rate of those living elsewhere in Michigan. Um, the death rates for those that are 50 to 59, which we find pretty startling, is 122% higher than the rest of Michigan. Um, for, the, for the individuals in the age cohort of 60 to 74, their death rate is 48% higher than the rest of uh, Michigan. Uh, next slide. And slide, this slide essentially um, has some, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't appear to be, but it's very, what I'll say is profound and also some very startling information in regards to the fact that 89% or close to 135,000 of our constituents are dealing with one chronic illness. Um, now, that may not seem like much because we all deal with issues such as arthritis or, or um, you know, diabetes or, you know, we know someone that has strokes or, you know, even some dementia or things of that nature. But the real startling fact and the real f issue that's what I would say is profound for our community and is really a call for action is the fact that our community or our constituents, our older adults, are dealing with three or more chronic illnesses at a rate as far as 39 percent. So approximately 60,000 individuals in our community are trying to navigate life while dealing with three or more chronic illnesses, which is something in which we're really trying to um, address. And in our perspective and from our mind, chronic illness, we've, we've, had the, we've had the pandemic as far as COVID, but chronic illness is also or remains an epidemic and is at an epidemic level in our community. And so it also plays a dis, uh, disproportionately high rate as far as the death rate in our, in our community. And so the reason in which I highlight these uh, stats is because they really reflect what we consider to be population health perspectives. These are population health uh, statistics as related to what's occurring in our community. And so in response to this data and response to the census, um, census reports, um, our agency has really tried to be proactive in regards to what we do. And um, the next slide will reveal in regards to our service model. And this service model is just what I'll say a small, it's, I'm not going to say a small portion, but it's a, a snapshot of the services that we deliver to keep individuals in their homes and to keep them um, able to age in place. Um, we like to say that if you are able-bodied and you can, um, you're, you want to participate in social services or social activities, we have programs and activities for you. This continuum of care goes all the way through to those individuals that are uh, disabled or maybe homebound or dealing with um, ADLs or IADLs as far as activities of daily living that may impact their ability to function. We have services and programs to, to assist with your quality of life in that manner. Um, if you're a caregiver, um, we recognize that caregiving is a, um, and I'll speak about that a little later, but caregiving, it to, in our opinion, is the backbone of the healthcare system. And I say it's the backbone in, as far as the healthcare system, especially when you take a look or you consider the fact that we're taking a look, uh, um, we access to care is a major issue in our community, along with the fact that, you know, the, to complement the shortage of direct care workers and also the family caregivers, uh, the, the family caregivers really have to step in and play that role and play a vital role. And I say this also when, in allusion to the fact that when you consider that 70 to 80 percent of the medical care that an individual receives actually occurs in the community. The role of the caregiver, whether it's the direct, uh, direct care worker or if it's that family caregiver, is critical in our health care system. So these services kind of reflect the continuum of care in which the, um, which, as far as the services in which we provide. But to um, kind of wrap it up or to, to kind of drill down as far as what our focus areas are, um, there are six areas in which DAAA is going to be focusing upon to really bridge that gap as related to um, 
uh, helping out in regards to addressing some of the health disparities and some of the health inequalities in our community, along with recognizing the increased um, uh, demographic um, population shifts that we're seeing. The first issue in which we're taking a look at as far as healthcare literacy. And when I say healthcare literacy, okay, well, I don't think that slide made it in. Well, and I say in regards to healthcare literacy, what we're talking about um, really is twofold. One is from an education and awareness perspective in regards to just um, raising um, the, uh, um, the awareness or the knowledge of what are, what are some of the factors or what are some of the conditions or what could be done to prevent some of the um, conditions that our population is facing. But one perspective in which we really think that healthcare literacy really needs to be focused upon is that when individuals get to our point and as far as they, when they knock on our doors for services, we're at the point in time in which we're providing treatment most of the time. We need to start to be able to work downstream across the lifespan in regards to working with youth and families earlier on so that we could prevent some of these chronic illnesses. So from a community base, we really need to see what we can do and we're going to be pushing and working to really enhance the healthcare literacy. The next item which we're focusing on is health promotion and preventative services. Um, our agency have created what we call community wellness service centers and we've introduced um, over 14 evidence-based um, health and wellness programs. And these programs include everything from falls prevention to uh, dealing with dementia and the caregivers working with dementia, nutrition, um, therapy, um, diabetes, and, and, and other aspects of, um, of what we would consider uh, the lifespan or some of the chronic conditions that individuals would deal with. And we're very pleased to announce that one of our most recent diabetes evidence-based programs was just fully recognized by the Centers for Disease Control. So that is something that we will be pushing out and we'll be continuing to work uh, to share with our constituents. Um, the next item, as I uh, spoke about, is in regards to caregiving services and supports. This has to be the linchpin in regards to us truly addressing um, health care at, at a community-based level. And, you know, I spoke about as far as the, the need for the support for our direct care workers and then also for our family caregivers. But there's an, an initiative in which we're working on with um, the Michigan Public Health Institute. And this initiative is in regards to uh, what I would say is a, our, our team effectively calls it as far as Angie, the Angie of um, health care. And it allows individuals out of the community to go on an app and find a direct care worker in which they could contract with directly. And it's a beta program and it's one in which we are excited about to see if it helps the direct care workers in regards to being able to retain more of their uh, wages and also in regards to uh, really driving down to what we consider to be person-centered uh, care or person-centered planning. Um, the fourth item in which we are really will be focusing upon is social care or social determinants of health or social, how do we work to re, uh, alleviate some of these social uh, barriers to care. And so we are currently working with MPHI and also the state AARP office to bring community stakeholders together to um, develop what we consider to be a community roadmap to address some of these social determinants of health. One of the things that we realize is that when we talk about some of these social barriers to care, social determinants of health, we're really looking at issues that are, are include housing that focuses upon government, um, also the environment, um, and also education. So it's going to need to be a collective uh, community lift in order for us to have a collective impact in regards to addressing some of these SDOHs. But it's one in which we're convening in regards to partnerships with MPHI and with the state um, AARP, AARP office. Um, the fifth item is in regards to access to care. Um, this has to be um, a priority just as the others. And so to address that, we are, you know, as most of our colleagues throughout the state have done, is we've implemented a telehealth program uh, with remote patient monitoring uh, services. And one of the things that I like to say and kind of brag about is related to what our agency did 
is during the um, height of COVID, we were able to partner with federally qualified health organizations to implement what we, can, uh, what we call as a homebound vaccination program for our constituents. And this program was initially um, done so that we could provide COVID vaccinations to individuals that were homebound in our community. Our initial goal was to serve 400 individuals. Today, I'm proud to say that we have provided over 2,700 shots in the arms to over 2,100 individuals, um, uh, as far as the, those that are homebound and also their caregivers. And we are also working to implement a home-based primary care program to get more comprehensive medical care to our constituents. Now, the last item in which we're really focusing upon, and I won't spend much time on it, is the modernization of our programs and services. When we talk about this uh, population boom and we talk about, um, um, you know, the grain of America, the grain of southeastern Michigan and the like, one of the things we have to recognize is that there's even a stratification within those cohorts or within those populations. So you can have your older adults and then you can have those that we consider your middle-aged older adults and then you can have your younger older adults. Well, we recognize that our younger older adults, that they will not uh, be interested in the same package of services that some of our older older adults are. And we also have to see how we can bring technology and, and the like into um, the service mix. So from a modernization perspective, we'll be taking a look at things from that perspective. So these are just a few of the initiatives that are underway. And the next slide is just to show that we are not only committed to taking care of our constituents, but we also are committed to doing so in efficiently, effectively, and in a person-centered manner. Um, so in closing, I, you know, I find it fitting to share with this committee that addresses um, family, children, and seniors, or and addresses essentially individuals across that lifespan. Um, and, you know, I just like to offer that each and every one of us has a little old man or a little old woman inside of us that will come out later. Are we ready for them? So with that, I just thank you all for your time and um, open for any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taylor, for that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm looking at what you said, uh, young, young, older adults. I'm hoping I fit in that category. <laughs> I, I, you know, Wait, I, what's the age of the young older? It, it, it differs. What does that look it like? Differs, <laughs> it differs, but there's what uh, folks who generally say like between 60 and 70 is the younger older adults, oh, 70 to 80 or 70 to 74 is the middle, and then above 74 is kind of your older, older adults. Your older, older. Mm -hmm. All right, because now, you know, on a serious note, when I looked mm -hmm. at your uh, slide on the mortality before and after age 60, and you're looking at between 50 and 59, and so that's where I, I am mm -hmm. currently, um, being over 122% higher. Mm -hmm. And then we have that conversation about one in five are in poverty. Mm -hmm. And then we have that, that conversation about just being educated on good health in general. I mean, it's all in there together. It is, and um, Madam Chair, I will say the other issue that is really driving that from um, some of our perspective and why I think is critical as far as our partnerships, especially with federally qualified health centers, is that the lack of health care insurance often leads to a number of these, a uh, number of our younger folks not receiving the medical care in which they need earlier on in their lives. So the ability to link up and to bridge those resources is going to be critical and, and as part of that collective lift. Yeah. One other question mm -hmm. for you. Um, do you all still offer any type of support for grandparents raising grandchildren? That, that used to be a really big thing when I was there. Could you just speak to that a little bit? It is still huge for <laughs> us, and it's something that we are uh, continuing to invest in. But grandparents raising grandchildren, um, or kinship care mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is something that we are focusing upon and we are working with a number of individuals. And there's been some estimates that in, in, um, in the households within the city of Detroit that there's probably, um, and I would have to validate this, but what I've understood is that there's 30% of our households have a grandparent that's raising a grandchild or someone that's uh, a uh, kinfolk that is raising a, a loved one. 
So we are continuing to focus upon that. And I'll, if I could just take a second to just add on to that. The, our, our ability, and I heard Ms. Thompson speak um, a little earlier in regards to her uh, issues, is that the, the creation of our Grandparents Raising Grandchildren program was a direct result of our, my pre, our previous uh, CEO, Paul Bridgewater, experiencing the issue of have, going through the process of trying to uh, navigate guardianship and the like to get his grandchild. Mm -hmm. And it, it really came home as related to what life issues we are all dealing with. So yes, that's a focus for us. All right, thank you. Committee members, any others have any questions? Oh, all right, well, I think that's it. Oh, oh yeah, you're all set. Thank you so much for your presentation okay. today. Thank you. We appreciate that. Okay. And before we adjourn, I have a, uh, three cards to read in in support. Uh, we have Jeff Cobb, Education Trust, Trust Midwest, in support of uh, those three bills that we voted out today, House Bills 46, 76, 77, and 78, not wishing to speak. Also not wishing to speak, uh, Tom Hickson, Michigan Catholic Conference, in support of all three bills. Not wishing to speak, but in support. Bobby, <laughs> you, you tried to help me out here, Tarigo, <laughs> uh, Michigan's children in support of the three bills we voted out earlier today. And so with that, I don't see any absent members. I need a motion to adjourn. Okay, Representative Glanville. With that, the Committee on Family, Children, and Seniors stands adjourned. Thank you.